and welcome to everyone who's in the audience and uh, I'm sorry that I can't see you and it's a very strange kind of experience still after a year of teaching online still feel strange sitting here in my living room talking to um, uh, people that I can't see but anyway that's partly why culture matters I guess. Um, I am uh, I'm a, I'm a professor of Thai cultural studies, so I work specifically on Thailand, and I will be talking a little bit about Thailand in the presentation. Um, I'm also chair of the Center for Cultural, Literary and Postcolonial Studies, which we abbreviate to CCLPS. And CCLPS is the sort of home of three of our MA programs, um, MA Comparative Literature, uh, MA Postcolonial Studies and MA Cultural Studies. So I'm happy to take um, questions in particular about MA Cultural Studies, which is the uh, MA program that I convene. And uh, I wanted to really talk more generally this evening about the, the broader question of why culture matters. So we've had a really fun year with the MA group this year. I teach the kind of the two um, compulsory units, the two core units for the MA program, which are on theory and methodologies and kind of broad concepts of cultural studies. But I wanted to broaden that out this evening to be thinking more, more widely really about what culture is and why it's so important and how, how it permeates really so much of what we do, whether we're working on in the field of culture, arts and humanities, or indeed in kind of other sub subject areas like the social sciences and the hard sciences. So let's see if I can make my PowerPoint slides work. Okay, so I wanted to think broadly, actually, because what you know, one of the things that we're doing at SOAS, because obviously this is SOAS's speciality, is to be is to be working on Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. And so much of the kind of uh, field of cultural studies has grown out of British cultural studies and the work of Stuart Hall and the Birmingham School, and out of the work that's done on culture in uh, North America. So it's a very kind of um, it's. It's a field that has a very kind of Western origins. So the kind of work that we're doing at SOAS on cultural studies is refocusing, shifting the focus onto the study of Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, and why and how cultural studies relates to those areas. So broadly speaking, that means that um, we're dealing with questions about knowledge production and knowledge of the other. And I don't know how many of you have come across the work of Edward, the late Edward Said and his kind of um, seminal work, Orientalism, that he wrote in 1978. But um, a major thrust of Edward Said's argument was that um, in Western studies of the so-called Orient, um, the, that area of the world was othered. It was made other or different um, in a split of self as the West and other as uh, the world beyond the West. And very much, I think, part of the work that we uh, do in terms of cultural studies at SOAS deals with the question of what I call global intercultural dialogue. So it's looking at the interaction between self and other, between the West the and Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, Middle East and looking at it in terms of the need um, for understanding the significance and importance of intercultural dialogue, of intercultural understanding. People do things differently in different parts of the world. We know, we all know that. Um, so uh, those differences are mediated through cultural difference. And that's why culture matters so much. So I'm going to be looking this evening at the role of intercultural understanding, the significance of culture, the dynamics of knowledge production, how all of those things are inflected by the processes of globalization and trying to unravel some of the kind of fantasies about globalization that it paints universalism as the solution to everything. And as two strands to that, thinking about the importance of empathy and the benefits of embodiment as ways of promoting um, better intercultural dialogue and better cultural understanding. And I know that you have the, um, you have a Q and A function, so um, I won't be talking for the whole hour this evening. Obviously, um, I will try and wind up within 
20 minutes or so from here and very happy to take questions about the kind of ideas that I'm talking about here. So we've got some major global challenges at the moment in the world, um, not least, of course, the global pandemic that is COVID-19. Um, the life-threatening inter interconnected challenges that the world currently faces, not only COVID-19 and the uh, global pandemic, but also unsustainable development, climate change, mass migration, violence, war, and the enormous and growing gap between rich and poor, all of these things call for a united scholarly intervention. They're challenges that require engagement with cultural difference for urgent international cooperation. So th what, I'm, what I'm saying here is that any of the major challenges that we now face, such as climate change, such as a global pandemic, can only be um, uh, can only be engaged with through the lens of cultural understanding. Without cultural understanding, we are incapable of working collectively towards global solutions for the kind of international and and um, world crippling um, problems that we currently face. The notion that all human beings would end up sharing the same values and norms was prevalent before the turn of the millennium. So there was a thrust in cultural studies and in the arts and humanities in general, that globalization would mean a kind of flattening out of the world where everything would essentially be the same. And we would all automatically be able to understand each other better because we would all be more or less the same as a result of the process of globalization. Other cultures were thought by the West to be safely en route to the same end destination where the West was impatiently waiting for them. So a kind of idea that development followed one particular kind of line or trajectory and that um, the West was in the vanguard of that trajectory and that everyone else would sort of catch up sooner or later. But in reality, globalization has actually made differences between people more prevalent recognizable and significant. So in fact, the effects of globalization have been in a sense to heighten our awareness of difference rather than to flatten everything out into sameness. We are now more acutely aware of difference and we can look at issues like international migration um, to point up the kind of issues that that produces at the local local level in terms of the kind of fractiousness of experience of cultural difference. So one of the ways of countering this is to foster better intercultural dialogue through intercultural understanding. We can't do that without an understanding of the other, however we define the other acknowledging cultural difference. So rather than trying to erase it through a flattening of globalization, actually embracing the fact that peoples across the world are different. That's one of the main things that I think we sign up to at SOAS. And I've been working at SOAS um, for, for the whole of my career since the end of the 1980s and was an undergraduate student learning Thai language and Southeast Asian history at SOAS in the early 80s. So. I know that the institution is absolutely dedicated to the study of different cultures and the appreciation of the tremendous things that an awareness of a different culture and knowledge of, an, of a different culture can bring to us. What we're trying to, to avoid at all costs is what Samuel Huntington famously referred to as a clash of civilizations. Since that notion of clash leads to animosities and conflict and gets in the way of working collaboratively across cultures and across disciplines to build a creative and egalitarian East-West dialogue or South-North South dialogue. Cultural difference then from a cultural studies perspective and indeed from an anthropological and sociological perspective is at the foundation of societal variations. 
And it's important to recognize that culture is embedded in all forms of human behavior. I always start off my cultural studies uh, MA year by asking people to define what their own national culture is or how they see their own relationship to a specific form of cultural belonging. And it always produces a range of really, really interesting answers and ideas. It's imperative that we acknowledge contrasting cultural perspectives and champion the value of seeing the world as relational. And that's another sort of key point here, that the world is not made, of, uh, made up of isolated, um, isolated countries, isolated nations, isolated groups of people, but instead, as this kind of illustration fails to show, they're all very much interlocking. They all relate to each other and, don't, and can't be separated out. It's really important then through, um, because of this relationality, to be able to understand and respect the, um, the various kind of interlocking features of the way in which we relate to each other across the world. So part of the problem that we have to deal with um, that Edward Said um, kind of points up to us as well, uh, very much in, in work such as Orientalism and which are fundamental to post-colonial studies, is that um, so-called universalism is not really universal. It's actually very often Western. And knowledge production is also driven by dominant Western forces and tends to kind of undermine what can be offered in terms of knowledge production from different parts of the world. Knowledge production has been dominated by Western thought and intellectual traditions on the basis of arguing that those traditions are universal when in fact they're not, they're very culturally specific. Institutions in Asia, Africa and the Middle East often do so from a Western model of knowledge production. Sorry, oh, that's a slight, there's a slight error on my slide that I've, I haven't edited. Um, often produce knowledge based on a Western, knowledge, Western model of knowledge production. And this is problematic for studies that focus on Asia, Africa and the Middle East, because in the quest for understanding these regions, a Western understanding of them is produced. Now, you might think it's strange that an institution based in the heart of London might be so wedded to producing um, knowledge of the world, which is um, trying to become attuned to and aware of um, Western forms of knowledge production. But that's very much what the um, decolonization of knowledge agenda at SOAS is aiming to do. And we've worked a lot this year on thinking through um, how one can decolonize the field of cultural studies. You just keep an eye on the time so I don't speak for too long, okay. Um, one of the linchpins really of Western knowledge and Western knowledge production comes from the Cartesian hypothesis from René Descartes, I think, therefore I am. This very much lies at the, West, at the root of Western thought and the root of Western knowledge production, the idea of knowing the world coming from um, a thinking position. Knowledge comes from the brain, from the head. But in other parts of the world, in other cultures across the world, this is not necessarily the, the sole uh, or only root of knowing. Knowing can come from different parts of the body, different experiences, and cultural studies can explore alternatives to dominant Western notions of the mind-body divide. Prioritizing core non-Western values of connectedness and interrelationships could promote new approaches to learning about and engaging with different others. So one of the things that I'm interested in exploring in my own cultural studies work and my own research that goes beyond the kind of teaching that we do on the MA Cultural Studies Programme is around the questions of empathy and embodiment, which I see as being really central to knowledge production. Cultural studies must take into account discoveries, not only in its traditional fields of the humanities and the social sciences, but also in the natural sciences. The findings of neuroscience and cognitive psychology point to a need for recognizing the role of emotions and embodiment. And these are things that are much more readily recognized in other cultural spheres, 
than they are in the Western sphere. Culture affects memory, attention, perception, and the ways in which human beings feel, think, and speak. In short, culture is not only an intellectual add-on, but it's rooted in the brain, guts, heart, DNA, and every part of the human body, emotion, and being. So what I want to do next at this point is give you a case study about the way in which I've been using uh, my own uh, kind of knowledge and training in cultural studies to address a particular issue, a particular research issue, which is connected up with what we call um, transdisciplinarity or pandisciplinarity, running across disciplines, including the arts and humanities, the social sciences, and the natural sciences. And given that I work on Thailand, you won't be surprised to hear that my case study comes from Thailand, perhaps. So just in case you don't know much about Thailand and are not a Southeast Asianist, this is where we are on the map. Um, and the research work that I've actually been doing is around this particular area here. So the Mekong River runs down here. And the research work that I've been doing um, is in the area around the Mekong River. And the reason for that is because the Mekong River is a source of fish for local people. So many of the peoples around this Mekong area have a, a heavy diet in fish, uh, which they eat with, with rice. And why am I telling you this? Because I've been doing work um, with a, a, a huge interdisciplinary team of um, scientists, um, biochemists, surgeons, uh, medical doctors, parasitologists, geographers, anthropologists, um, ecologists, environmentalists, and people working in the field of religious studies, cultural studies, um, sociolinguistics, what else, um, and art and literature, bringing all those people together over discussions of this particular fish dish, which is eaten in Northeast Thailand, Lao PDR and parts of Cambodia. It's raw fish salad, locally referred to as goi pla, and it's a fish, a, a raw fish dish made with cyprinid fish, that's white, uh, white fish with scaly fish that um, are prolific in the Mekong River and the river areas around the Mekong. And the problem with this dish is that although people have been eating it and it's a great sort of cultural delicacy and has been so for you know the last five or 600 years in this area, it actually poses a health problem because the fish um, is, in, is infested with liver fluke and the liver fluke, um, if you eat the fish raw, the liver fluke um, is ingested and can sit in part of the liver, the bile duct, um, and produce um, bile duct cancer 20 or 30 years after the dish is ingested. So here's a case where um, doctors um, are kind of tearing their hair out because they have a cancer which they they're aware of a cancer which, is, which has been produced by what the World Health Organization has classified as a class one carcinogen, the liver fluke. So here, there, the proliferation of bile duct cancer in this region of Southeast Asia, doctors know comes from cultural practice. It comes from the cultural practice of eating raw fish, which is why cultural studies and awareness of cultural cult, culture can play a role in trying to understand questions of public health and questions of people's behavior. It's one of the ways in which, uh, in which I can demonstrate that culture matters because with an understanding of people's cultural practices, we can bring about changes in a whole wide range of, um, or we can aspire to bring about changes in a whole wide range of problems and practices. So this has received quite a lot of coverage in the press, in the BBC, the New York Times, um, as, as a cancer producing dish produced by the, appear, by the liver fluke present in the fish, which lo lodges in the, in the liver and produces um, scarring that in, in the end can lead to, to cancer. 
let me relate that finally to the question of, cult of culture again through a reference to the Sukhothai inscription, an early inscription discovered in 1833, but dated back to 1292. It was found in the early Thai kingdom of Sukhothai, um, which was active in the 12th and 13th centuries, um, and which was the source of the earliest example of Thai script. And one of the famous things which is said in the Sukhothai inscription is this famous two, two liner, in the water there is fish, in the fields there is rice. It's an indication from this early inscription that Thailand or this part of, of what is now Thailand um, was abundant. Uh, there was no lack of food. There was no lack of, of, of source, a source of protein. There was always fish in the water and rice in the fields. And this kind of um, cultural artifact allows us to understand just why it's so important, if you date it this far back, just why it's so important for people to continue the cultural practices that they do through eating particular forms of food, so that it's much more complicated than doctors unfortunately would have it, that you can simply tell people not to do something that has is an embedded cultural practice, that it relates to their identity, their well-being, their sense of um, community, and their kind of social cohesion. Um, so culture is so much more important than simply kind of things that we can um, dictate around or mitigate against or kind of legislate against. That's why in the uh, work that I was doing with this team of medics to try to uh, resolve questions of, uh, of, of particular cultural practice that had health risks, we brought in um, questions of the arts so we had a community art um, uh, project which allowed people to explore their own questions of health and well-being and diet and food and community and so on through, through the arts. And we brought in the work of a very famous Thai film director um, who won the Palm Door at Cannes in 2010, um, whose nickname is Joe, luckily for most people who are not Thai speakers who won the um, uh, Palm Door in Cannes in 2010 for his film, Uncle Boon Me, which can recall, who can recall his past lives. There's my cat involved in the presentation as well. Um, so I just wanted to end up really with talking about the way in which culture kind of seeps through everything. It's, it, it may seem to be invisible and not kind of immediately noticeable, but actually, Culture is so important to so many of the things that we do and so many of the ways in which we relate to each other. And I hope that's given you a kind of um, a, a, a taster of the ways in which I think culture really matters. Okay, thank you for, your, for listening to me and uh, I'm gonna come out of the slideshow now, stop sharing my screen and open up the floor for questions. Brilliant, thank you, thank you so much. <clears throat> Um, like I said earlier, if you do have any questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A box and we'll um, start answering them. We've got one that's come through that said, do you plan to teach the course remotely again next year? Ah, oh, that's an excellent question. I don't know whether I'm the right person to answer that. I wish I knew that COVID-19 was going to go away and we'd all be vaccinated and, uh, and everything will be safe. Our aspiration, I think, is to teach face-to-face -face as much as possible. And I have to say that I know me and my colleagues are missing it so much because there's so much that goes on in a classroom, you know, in terms of face-to-face -face interaction. Here I am talking about culture and embodiment, but we're not embodied when we're sitting, you know, in our own separate spaces speaking over a screen. But unfortunately, I can't answer that question. It really depends on what is happening in terms of government advice. Um, so I don't know, there may be somebody who can give you a clearer answer than me, but I can say, I hope so. Yeah, I'm um, just going to echo what Rachel said. Unfortunately, we don't. There's no clear answer at the minute with all the government regulations changing. Um, like Rachel said, we do hope to teach face to face in September, but obviously this is subject to, to change based off of um, what happens with COVID. 
Um, we've had a question that says, does the cultural studies MA allow you to select modules from other disciplines? Yes, absolutely. Yes. It, yes. If you if you go online and look at what the list of options are, um, we have the two co core 15, 15 um, credit modules in um, uh, now I can't remember the name of them, the, uh, theory and methodology of cultural studies in term one and new horizons of case studies in term two. Um, but aside from that, um, you're picking your modules from a variety of different disciplines, for example, in politics, in anthropology, in media studies, um, you can do modules in, in literature and and post-colonial studies, but you're not constrained or confined to doing only modules available through the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics. So yes, absolutely. I see it very much as an interdisciplinary degree. And I think, you know, with the work that we do in the core courses for thinking through what cultural studies is and, and, the, and its various methodologies, you then apply that to the different kind of, um, credit modules that you want to take either normally 15 credit modules but sometimes taught through the year as 30 credit modules and i would say as well that quite a number of people are also consider taking a language as part of that because one of the best ways in which we can really understand uh, what what cultural difference is and how people constitute their own kind of awareness of cultural difference is absolutely through language and that was the way that I came to cultural Thai cultural studies through doing a degree in Thai language first of all and that really helps you to absolutely understand how things are differently experienced what different priorities there are in different cultures and they're all expressed through different kind of language different forms of using language brilliant um, the next question is, how big is the course expected to be this year? I can say that this this year in the in the core course, I had 20 students in in term one and slightly fewer in term two. So, so you can take the core units without actually doing the MA in cultural studies. Um, so I, I, I mean, we'd I'd hope for a slightly larger group than that. Um, but I think 20 to 25. Lovely. Um, someone's asked what career paths or endeavors outside of academia would you say cultural studies lends itself to? Ooh, that's a really good question because I think you can use cultural studies in in anything you do actually because I think that one of the things we don't really realize is and that's what I was trying to get across in the presentation is just how important cultural studies is to every encounter that we have even even if it's a mono monocultural encounter um, because so much of what we talk about in cultural studies is engagement with difference, engagement with otherness. And whether we're working um, within our own cultures or across cultures, those kinds of ideas and skills that we learn can actually translate into any field of work. So, I mean, when I started off talking, I was talking about really kind of international diplomacy in a sense and international politics and climate change and environmental work and, you know, work as, as for example, with non-government organizations and so on. But obviously people go into cultural studies also with an interest in very specific things like arts management and, you know, film curating and, and, and museum curating and so on. So I think there's a, a huge range of things that you can do with a degree in cultural studies that you know, are, are there at the level of kind of transferable skills that come from the very issues that we're talking about. Lovely. <clears throat> um, we've had a question come in that says, what are the main differences between cultural studies and anthropological? Anthropological, oh, I've mean, definitely messed that up. That's for the logical ones. Yes. Yeah. Well, they are interrelated, but we have a different methodological approach. So anthropologists do things like ethnography and field work, and they go and, and sort of, um, you know, sit in villages and and do a year of field work, observing how villagers behave and relate to each other and so forth. Cultural studies doesn't really use that methodology. We're doing a lot of text based methodology. So we're doing close readings of things like you know, film posters, cultural artifacts, um, 
uh, we, yeah, we do use a, we use a lot of film for looking at the ways in which different cultures kind of prioritize certain issues. We look at last week we did in the cultural studies class um, a, a, a lecture on street protest in Myanmar and Thailand and the kind of iconography that people use in terms of street protest and so on. You could have an anthropological approach to that, I guess, but it would be more about the ways in which people are sort of speaking to each other and relating to each other than the actual kind of cultural material that they're using. So one of the things that we looked at last, last week, for example, was why um, protesters in central Bangkok in 2010 protested using baguettes when nobody in Thailand actually eats baguettes. And it was an allusion to um, the, the, the Arab Spring and the way that the Tunisians had protested at the time. And so, you know, we're looking at intercultural connections in that sense, which is much more cultural studies than it is anthropology. Um, but there are, there are interrelationships, there are kind of cross um, similarities in some senses between the two. And part of the cultural studies MA would certainly allow you to take courses in anthropology. But there's a methodological difference, which is around the kind of material that we're looking at. Lovely. Um, someone said, do you recommend doing the MA cultural programme for someone who wants to focus on critical dance studies? Yes, very much so, because dance is something that we would certainly kind of be interested in. It's dance and performance would be part of the kind of the, the, the cultural framework that we would be looking at. So yes, and certainly because it's got that element of embodiment as well, I think it would fit really well with a cultural studies, um, cultural studies program. Brilliant. Um, and the last question that's come up for now is, um, how flexible is the MA course in terms of doing it part-time and working part-time? Yeah, so some people do it over two years and some people do it over three. Um, we just, split the kind of components differently depending on the number of years. Three is the maximum. Um, the, one of the key components of the MA programme, of any MA programme at SOAS, is to write a, a 10,000 word dissertation. And whether you're part-time or full-time, that's always done in the last three to four months of the degree. So um, that aside, the rest of the degree is made up of taught modules. And if you're taking taking the program over two years, you'll do sort of half the modules in one year and half the modules in the next. And the split is slightly more awkward over three years, but basically it's absolutely possible to, to work and do the degree part-time. And I've got some students doing that this year. Um, and we try and be as flexible as we can and give as much support as we can to working, to doing to doing work and, and studying. Um, so I think it's, yeah, it's an important, Important. Um, it's important to have that ability to do it part time for sure. Lovely. Um, oh, we have had some come up. Before we go to the questions, I do want to give a little bit of time to the student ambassador that's joined on this call. Um, if you don't mind, can you no, briefly. I was, I was, yeah, I was actually going to jump in um, after Rachel's question because I'm actually doing part time um, this year. Um, I'm on my first year, so obviously I haven't had any experience with balancing a job and in-person lectures and tutorials. But in terms of online teaching, it has actually been quite manageable. I mean, a lot more than I thought it would be, um, especially with recorded, pre-recorded lectures. Um, it's so much more simple if you're working. So I, I work in a cafe. Um, and I do, I mean, I do this as well, obviously, but um, if there's a shift that comes up and I have a lecture, I can just be like, oh, I can just watch it tomorrow or late in the evening. So um, as both of you said, we don't know if it's going to be online or in person next year, but if you're working part time and doing it part time, yeah, it's, it's definitely very manageable, yeah. And I think even if we're teaching face to face, to be honest now, we're so used to recording that I, I think we'll record everything and so people who can't come to class will still be able to catch up on things they miss which is much more useful for for part-time students if there if there's a clash brilliant um we've had a follow-up question from the student that asked about critical dance studies they okay. said are there any faculty specialized with dance studies by any chance not no not that i know of unless there are in ethnomusicology but i don't think so um, but the nearest I can think to that is we do have 
people working in yoga studies, which is not, I know it's not dance, but it's, but you know, um, but nobody, nobody specifically in dance studies as far, um, not that I can think of anyway, but have a look at the ethnomusicology um, department, the music department, see what their speciality is. There are certainly a team of ethnomusicologists. Brilliant. Um, and then a question has come and it says, do cultural studies students do field work? If so, what is the difference between this course and social anthropology that focuses on the field work? Yeah. yeah. So no, cultural studies students don't do field work at the moment unless you do it as part of your dissertation. So when it comes to the end of the year, if you're doing it part, sorry, if you're doing the course full time, the teaching comes, comes to an end at the end of um, at, at the end of term two, which is the end of March normally. Um, coursework is completed and exams are taken if there are any in May, June. And by early June, it's time to start working on the dissertation and you have up until mid-September to do that. Some people um, do decide that they want to do what we call primary research for their dissertation. So there's no requirement to do that. But if you wanted to do field work as part of the dissertation, you could do. And the way we manage the dissertations is that around about this time of year, everybody um, kind of has a, a think about what kind of topic they'd like to work on. And we, we appoint a supervisor with, with kind of specialist knowledge of that area. And then you work with your supervisor to see how you want to go about doing that topic. And if you want to include as part of that one or two months of field work, um, then that's absolutely fine. So the answer is yes, you can do it. And no, you don't have to do it. <laughs> Lovely. Um, I just wanna see if our student ambassador, if you wanna talk a little bit about um, what your experience has been like so far as a student and sort of what um, your degree has been like, what you're specializing in, anything like that. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, so I started this year, I moved to London um, initially, because I thought um, things were going to get normal sooner than they, they haven't yet. <laughs> but um, it's been, yeah, it's been great. Um, in terms of, I guess I'll speak first about online teaching, um, which has been a bit different from having in person, definitely. Um, but as I said previously, it's, it has made things a lot more flexible um, in terms of, you know, life, work, uh, I want to say fun is well balanced, but there hasn't actually been any fun uh, in terms of socializing and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been it's been really good, um, especially tutorials. Um, we usually have quite small groups, like between ten and fifteen people, and doing breakout rooms and discussing the readings, and then going back into a big room and just sharing different perspectives and you know criticisms that you know. We, we, we discuss in smaller groups has been it's, it's actually been quite I mean for me it has been you know very very um fulfilling in terms of knowledge more than I thought it would be I was a bit skeptical at first of online teaching I was like oh it's going to be quite different from in person blah 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 but it was it was it was really nice yeah um because I've moved to London I've actually gone to the library quite a lot mm -hmm. um and I've actually met quite a few of my course mates um, so it's been, it actually, it's actually been quite nice. Um, you know, sometimes we have lunch together um, outside, you know, social distancing. Um, and yeah, we're actually doing two group projects at the moment. And the, the, the ones of us that have moved to London is actually quite lucky because we were working on those two group projects together. Obviously the people that are abroad didn't have that um, chance. But I know people are also working in group projects online and it's been, it's been easy. I did that for first term for one, and it was, it was, it was quite easy. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been good. Um, in terms of being in London as well, it hasn't been. I don't feel like I've experienced London at all yet, apart from SOAS, obviously going in and walking around a lot, which in itself has already been quite quite nice. Just walking around London. Um, AMT London, which is probably a site I won't see for much longer and probably won't see <laughs> for a long time again. Um, but yeah, does anyone have any questions regarding 
moving to London, living in London, online lectures. Yeah, feel free to pop them in the Q and A oh, box. Sorry, yeah, I, I didn't talk about yeah, I didn't talk about my what I'm specializing in. So I did I did Japanese studies for my undergrad. Um, so I want to focus. Oh, I'm only doing my dissertation next year. But um, I've already spoken to who I want to be my supervisor because I came to Sales with a very clear um, direction what I wanted my research in because I want to progress into a PhD afterwards. Um, so I'm focusing on post Black Lives Matter um, racial awareness uh, in Japan. And I'm focusing on subcultural groups that have appropriated African American cultural and racial tropes like hip hop, um, break dancing. Um, there's this really small subculture called Ganguro where people still do blackface nowadays and it's kind of socially acceptable. So I'm focusing on that and seeing how those subcultural groups are navigating um, yeah, racial and cultural awareness in this post Black Lives Matter reality in Japan. Yeah, so if someone has any questions regarding Japan or um, stuff like that, I'm also happy to answer them, yeah. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um... I haven't, I don't see any questions in here right now, but we can maybe give it a couple of minutes um, to see if any come through. Here's one. Oh, there we go. Um, they're asking, what did you do your dissertation in for your undergrad? Oh, okay. So for my undergraduate dissertation, um, I, I did, uh, so I focus on, um, Afro-Japanese cultural interaction, um, and synthesis in contemporary samurai anime. So I, my, so my material that I focused on was two different Japanese animation series, and I analyzed how Afro-Japanese cultural racial social realms intertwined and formed a sort of um, new identity to overcome racialized perspectives of white hegemony. And I mean, I could, yeah, basically it was, it, it's, it, uh, so I'm, try, I'm trying to apply my undergrad research into real life through, um, I actually do social anthropology for my MA, I don't do cultural studies, um, but I believe they're quite similar apart from um, the ethnography that um, Rich was talking about because I, I I looked at the uh, structure and it, it's actually quite similar. Yeah, um, but yeah. Lovely, thank you. Um, don't see any more questions that have come through. Let me give it a moment. I also think that um, this is just an add-on, even though I'm doing it next year. Um, I think one of the big things, if you are if you want to focus on a specific region, whether it's Japan um, or another Asian country or African country, and you want to progress onto, you know, an MRES or a PhD or something like that afterwards, um, one, of, one of the big advantages you have at is that you have an exceptional range of academics that can teach you languages that you can't some of them you, I, I don't think you can you can um, um, learn them pretty much anywhere else at least in Europe that I know of um, really really small um, you know African and Asian language I mean Japanese you can't in other places but um, you know it's 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 a really 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 big advantage that you know you, you can't have in many other universities yeah Lovely. We've got one more come through. It says, as someone who didn't do a dissertation in their undergrad, how does it differ from a master's? Is it more pressured or more focused? Um, let me think. Um, Rachel, do you want to? Yeah, I can. I can say something to that. Um, we do have at undergraduate level. We have something called an independent study project, which is ten thousand words. Um, and and you get a bit of supervision for it, but you're basically on your own. Is the and the master's thesis is also ten thousand words, 
um, and you get about the same amount of supervision and you do it on your own. The only thing is, it's the, the only difference is that the master's thesis is reflecting the kind of things that you have learned um, during your master's level course. So quite often for coursework, you're, you're being asked to write essays of three, sometimes 4,000 words in length. Um, I think the fact that the dissertation comes at the end of the taught element of the course stands you in good stead to do the dissertation. So the fact that you haven't done a dissertation at undergraduate level it shouldn't matter because you'll be learning the skills that you need to do the MA dissertation during the MA year. Lovely. Um, another question says, how often do students do small discussion group style seminars? All the time. It's a, an integral part of the way that we teach. So most, most um, courses are taught uh, two, for two hours a week um, over a period of 20 weeks. And um, the first hour would be would normally be a lecture and the second hour would be a seminar slash tutorial. And what I've been doing since I've been doing it on Zoom is using breakout groups for small group discussions. And, and actually they, they work really well and you can drop into them um, virtually as a, as a teacher or sometimes we have a, a, um, a teaching assistant helping with that as well. Um, sometimes I invite my own PhD students to join and they'll sort of help facilitate the small breakout groups as well. But it's an important point, I think, of, it's a, an important aspect. And then we get together after the breakout and sort of pool ideas together in class. But the, for me, the important thing is really to, to facilitate an environment where people feel safe enough to explore ideas it's not about having to get everything right all the time or show how much you've read or you know sort of show that you know everything about everything it's really for us to collectively explore ideas and things that are interesting so even the opening session that we have about thinking through what is culture and what does it mean to us is all about kind of breaking down those hierarchical barriers so that we're kind of learning together lovely thank you so much um it doesn't look like there's any more questions in the q a so i just want to say a massive thank you to rachel and to our student ambassador for joining and for helping to answer all of the questions and thank you to everyone that's joined us tonight um i hope you all have a lovely evening like i said this is recording and recorded and it will be on our website soon so yeah thank you all so much Maybe I can just add one thing if it's not clear already that if you've got if if you go away from this and you've got extra questions that you didn't think of at the time, please do feel free to email me. Um, my email address is rh6 at soas.ac.uk or just go onto the SOAS website and key in my name, you'll find my contact details. It's Rachel Harrison. I'm happy, really happy to kind of take questions whenever you feel that you've got, you know, something that you want to ask about the course, then please do drop me a line. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I've, I've dropped my email as well in case you guys have any non-course related questions, whether it's about London or accommodation or anything like that, that I can be helpful. Um, just, yeah, drop me an email. Lovely, thank you so much and I hope everyone has a good evening. Bye. Bye-bye.